So thanks for having me. Um, I'm joining you from Canada on the East Coast. I think it's interesting to say these things in the uh, in these virtual conferences since people are from all over. So I was asked to give a talk overviewing One API and Data Parallels C++. And I'm pretty excited to talk with you about this today um, because I really like what Intel and Kronos have been doing um, in the industry for heterogeneous compute and what, what they're trying to build out as an ecosystem. Um, so I've been contributing to this project for around two years. And I think there's a, a, there are quite a few interesting things to share. So first, I work for Intel. So we'll just quickly show the. Uh, you know, the required legal side. So what I want to cover today are, uh, first, I want to talk about um, what an XPU is, um, and then what one API and a major component of it, Data Parallels C++ are. Um, and I, I particularly want to talk not just about what they are, but why they matter, and what the goals are, and how they, how they interact with the, the ecosystem of heterogeneous compute. And then I'll dive into some of the programming challenges and the design challenges that we've hit as we've been working on a variety of these different aspects of one API, particularly the, uh, the language data parallel C++. And we'll finish with uh, some thoughts on how you can contribute and how you can get involved, um, because there's, there's a lot that needs to be done and, and a lot that uh, could benefit from research and, uh, and, and just you know, contribution. So let me start with something that's not news to probably almost any of you, um, but I think it's important to set the stage for why we're talking about One API today. So first, if we look at the earlier days, say the 1970s onward of integrated circuits um, and the architectural decisions that were made, uh, the early days of, of um, chips effectively were really dominated by exponential scaling, meaning that uh, if you waited, then the next process generation or the next set of architectures would see significant performance gains and that led to uh, it being possible to have uh, have a real focus on generality. So a single architecture could do everything, and there was a lot of history with you know, the complex instruction set and the reduced instruction set architectures, CISC and RISC architectures, because the it was possible to have very, very general architectures, and if you didn't get the performance you needed today, you could either wait and get the performance down the road just automatically, or if, um, if you know, the application demands were going to scale over time, often the architectures would provide that scaling that was needed. But more recently, the silicon uh, trends have changed. And uh, as I think we all know, uh, we've needed to move to more and more specialization of architecture to get better performance out of the, the transistors. Uh, so we see things like multi-core CPUs and GPUs um, coming out until today. But really starting in the 2020s, uh, we're seeing more and more specialization. And a good example would be the machine learning accelerators that are tuned for very, very specific applications. And generality is, is a less of a, of a critical design goal. So the result of this is that we have more and more architectural diversity uh, in, the, in the landscape today. And the result of that is that you have to choose first your, um, your architecture very specifically for your workloads. So we see increasing specialization of the architectures, and it becomes more difficult to find an architecture that performs all of your workloads well. We see trade-offs away from generality, and there are just more and more architectures to learn how to program. And we see that a lot of the companies that are building, building chips today are forming this really difficult balancing act between getting performance on the specific workloads that they care about. Um, so you know, maybe a machine learning workload, maybe some math workload, um, versus generality, where the, the, the uh, application can be, um, or the, the accelerator can be used for a variety of applications and more grab broadly applicable. And often the metrics even used to determine these trade-offs are really complicated. So whether it's performance per area, performance per watt, performance per dollar, these trade-offs become difficult and we're seeing just a, a blow up of architectures. So what is an XPU? So an XPU is a term that Intel has been using a lot lately. And it's really just a name for a diverse set of architectures. Um, so effectively, any compute architecture is being called an XPU. Um, so for example, Intel's building CPUs. Uh, you see a picture of the Ponte Vecchio GPU, discrete GPU that's coming up from Intel. And, uh, and also, for example, FPGAs. Um, the Agile X line is one of, one of the Intel FPGA lines. And, and they're actually a pretty broad diversity of architectures that Intel makes. So the, the name XPU doesn't just matter because we want a name to talk about diverse set of architectures, but it matters because we need to think about 
and when we, when we talk about programming models and software frameworks, we're not just talking about the framework for a CPU. We need to talk about the framework now for an XPU. How do we enable through a single set of software stacks, tooling solutions, the broad range of accelerators, XPUs to be um, to be programmed? If we look at the programming landscape today, um, so if, if we look at the, the diagram on the right, for example, um, there are a variety of architectures and they have different characteristics. For example, some might have vector hardware, others might be matrix, some spatial like an FPGA. And uh, often those, those different applications that are going to perform well on one type of architecture, they often sit on top of middleware or frameworks or some kind of layering, but then they, they typically lower down to disjoint uh, programming mechanisms today, and that's fundamentally the problem that one API is trying to solve. So if you want to move from, say, a CPU to a GPU to an FPGA to test your application or to develop different aspects of your application, the different and disjoint programming mechanisms really limit your ability to move between these architectures. It's just the cost of actually learning a new architecture, learning new tooling, installing new tooling, making things work together is so high that it really limits the architectural freedom of choice. And as we look at what one API is, the diagram on the, the right here, um, you see where one API fits into the stack. And it's, it's a fairly large part of the software stack, but it effectively sits between applications and maybe middleware that support those applications and the diverse set of hardware. So the, the ambition of one API is pretty big. It is to provide a, a singles of one common interface layer that allows all of the underlying architectures you might care about to be accessed. Now, the access to those architectures should be through consistent frameworks, through consistent interfaces, um, but really importantly, it's, it's not, um, and we'll talk more about portability, but it's not the idea that you write a simple piece of code once and it works perfectly on all the architectures and achieves maximum performance, for example. Instead, it's the ability to have a consistent framework of tooling and interfaces to access these different uh, these different types of hardware. So important parts of this picture are, and, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these, um, but the open industry standard basis uh, is, is critical to actually building this ecosystem that's much broader than just Intel. And also interoperability and compatibility with existing languages so that it's not a wholesale switch from what you have today to a new set of uh, one API based standards and interfaces. Instead, there's a lot of integration possible to, to make the, the transition uh, smoother and to let you use it only where you, where you want to. So let's talk a little bit more about the different parts of one API and how they work together to start achieving the goals. So first, uh, if you look at the diagram on the right, we effectively expanded the, uh, the, the one API box and the software stack, and there are two main parts to talk about. Uh, so on the, uh, so the green, I'm talking about the green boxes. So let's start with the right-hand side, the API-based programming. And these are effectively library interfaces for common functions. So things like you know, the last matrix multiply, common functions that you would expect uh, a high quality software stack to provide for you so that you don't have to write them yourself. But most real applications don't, don't get formed just from those common libraries. You often have to add your secret sauce. So you have to add some level of um, you know, customization or the special stuff you're doing that wraps around those libraries or goes between library calls. And that's where the second box, direct programming, comes in and where data parallel C++ fits into the picture. We're going to talk about that a fair bit more. So one, one more thing I want to call out is that there, there is a, a really important distinction between the specifications that form what one API is um, and also the implementations of one API because the specs not useful in isolation. You of course need implementations you can actually use. A one API is fundamentally built to be implementable by everybody. So more than just Intel, usable by everybody, um, but also implementable by anyone. It's an open set of specifications. But of course, Intel is trying to really get behind this, this initiative to provide a consistent framework to access heterogeneous hardware. So Intel is building a, a one API product and it includes more than just the libraries and the direct programming language. It also includes things like a whole variety of tooling based on existing Intel tooling. Um, so for example, V2 and has been extended for FPGA is one, one minor example, but a lot of analysis, debug tools and a whole bunch of support, um, support around the base one API spec. So Intel's building this product and, um, and others are as well. 
So now let's dive into, I think, what is the, the really interesting part of this presentation, uh, data parallel C++. So again, this is the direct programming mechanism within the One API specifications and products. It's a consistent language that lets you access a variety of hardware. So before we dive into the details of exactly how, how the stack works and the standards it's based on, um, start with uh, some of the goals of actually, you know, when we went to choose, what, what should the baseline be for a data parallel C++ direct programming interface? Uh, so some of the, the core goals were that it was an open standard, so not, not proprietary, um, because of course we want, th this needs to be much, much broader than just Intel. So we need it to be able to run on architectures, to be successful, it needs to run on architectures that Intel doesn't make. It needs to be open so that anyone can extend it and implement it um, and, and do whatever is needed to make it useful across an even broader set of architectures. Open source was a really important part because it needs to be possible for people to um, experiment build new features, test those new features on their hardware, and then contribute them back. Um, and, and likewise, uh, people don't want to feel locked in as they lock or as they start to use a framework that accesses lots of different types of hardware. Having uh, the tooling and the, um, the specifications open source goes a long way. Performance transparency and single program multiple data are both SPMD, are both critical parts of what we wanted uh, when we looked at how to build this direct programming language. Performance transparency we'll talk about more and also SPMD. Um, but fundamentally, we wanted to make sure that there was uh, a direct set of interfaces that people could reason about what performance you would expect to get out of certain constructs on different types of hardware. So you can really reason about without compiler magic getting in the way how you can actually achieve performance and be more confident you can achieve performance on each of the different types of architectures. And there was also a focus on within node performance first, because that's where the big gap in the industry is. Uh, working across nodes, there are a lot of existing solutions, such as in, um, you know, in HPC, there are many cross node uh, communication libraries that are in, in heavy use and they work pretty well. There can be improvements, of course, but it was within the node that was the first problem with the many, the proliferation of different types of heterogeneous accelerators in a single node. Uh, really, the problem was to provide a consistent framework to access all of them in a unified way. So in the end, uh, we chose a modern C++ baseline, um, C++ 17 in the current invocation. And on top of that, uh, to provide all of the features needed for, uh, for extensive data parallel compute plus heterogeneous compute, uh, the baseline is the SICL standard from the Kronos group. So what is data parallel C++? And so let's start on the right. Uh, it's a stacking of a few different standards and some things that move faster on top. Um, so we start at the bottom with ISO C++, which is, uh, which is huge. It is the majority of data parallel C++, as you've guessed from the name. And uh, ISO C++, I mean, it's very expressive. It has a lot of usability features. It's a very powerful language. It's used by a lot of people today. So it is the baseline, uh, C++ 17. On top of that, we have Kronos Sickle which builds on top of C++ to add a whole bunch of primitives and uh, library features for things like uh, data parallelism. And then on top of that, we have uh, community extensions. And uh, all of these can be contributed to by anybody. Uh, so they're, they're all open in, some, in various ways for, for contribution. But they together form what we're calling data parallel C++. So you can think of it as an implementation of this stack of different, of different um, aspects of the, uh, the language. Now, why do we have the stack? Um, so with this slide and the next one, talk about some of the different um, interactions of these different layers of the stack and why they exist. So ISO C++ doesn't include many features for parallelism or heterogeneous compute. Um, it, it has some that are being proposed, things like executors, but we're still a long way from having heterogeneous, true heterogeneous compute support um, for the diverse set of architectures uh, in C++ itself. And that's a good thing. Now, that's what you'd expect. C++ moves slowly because it aims to standardize what's often called established best practice. You don't want it to move fast and to very quickly incorporate you know, experimental features, for example. You want best practice to be standardized by C++. So C++ takes a while to get features into. Um, often it's measured in, in years or decades. And even if C++ did get most of heterogeneous compute, um, or a lot of it included, it still probably wouldn't have everything because it, it establishes the common baseline as opposed to every possible feature anyone could want. So above that, you typically want something like Chronos Sickle, which is an open standard by the Chronos group um, that again, anyone can contribute to, anyone can implement, anyone can read for free um, and use for free. 
So the Kronos Sickle standard adds heterogeneous compute and parallelism constructs, and it moves faster, um, which makes it possible to experiment and actually in a standardized way so that many different vendors can implement. Um, you get a consistent interface that moves much faster than C++ and builds on ISO C++ and incorporates new features whenever they get into C++. But one to three years is still a relatively slow cadence, and Sickle wants to incorporate features that it knows work. So above that, we have community extensions, which are very fast moving. And effectively, there are extensions published on GitHub that can move at the speed of, of GitHub. Uh, as fast as you want to publish extensions and, and implement them um, and test them and evolve them, you can, you can build those on GitHub. And those are the proof points that motivate features going into Sickle and long term into C++. Um, so that you effectively think of these different layers of the stack as moving at different speeds and different levels of risk effectively. And as you go down in the stack, you get into more stable cross vendor uh, specifications and standards that get implemented. And another important part of this is that a lot of the uh, the work that's done higher in the stack feeds into the lower levels of the stack and actually vice versa. Um, things that go into C++ get brought, get pulled into Sickle in, in next versions and those get incorporated into the extensions. But the, the big flow of uh, transformations in these specs goes down. So very fast moving community extensions are used to prove out features. Uh, they get published, uh, they get implemented and then it proves that the features work, they're implementable, that they actually solve the problems. And then typically with some generalization or lessons learned from the implementation experience, those feed into Sickle. So Sickle typically looks for proof points from community extensions before standardizing things. And likewise, ISO C++ looks for best practice in the industry, such as something that's implemented in Sickle and in wide use. So these different layers of the stack feed into each other and provide the proof points to actually uh, standardize things going down. And not everything gets standardized going down the stack um, because there are some things that are so you know, architecture specific, they might not make sense in Sickle or ISO uh, C++ long term, but uh, you know, most of the features do feed downwards. And that's the, that's the exclusive design goal of many of these features. Another really important aspect of the, uh, these, this, the One API project uh, is open source. And uh, the top part here I think is really impressive that Intel is investing so heavily in it. Um, so the goal of this top link is an open source uh, project within LLVM. Um, so it's, it's a, based on LLVM and it's implementing Sickle, but the, the, the core goal of the project is to upstream full Sickle support into LLVM. So the goal is that anyone who downloads LLVM at some point in the future will just have Sickle support built in and not need to work to add it and can build their own products, uh, for example, based off of it. So Intel and people outside Intel are investing pretty heavily in, um, in building out this open source project and actually working with the community to upstream to LLVM. So there's a lot of activity there for anyone who's interested to contribute or to watch it. There's a lot happening. There's also a spec repo for the One API specs where if you want to get involved and you want to either contribute extensions or make changes to specs or file issues, there, all of this is being done in open source. So you can directly contribute and also see what else is going on with the One API specs that feed into the implementations, both Intel's and um, those outside Intel. So let's talk a little bit about Sickle, uh, which is the that middle layer of the stack, which sits above C++, but it's below the very, very fast moving, effectively experimental extensions. So Sickle itself gets released every few years, and it's gaining a lot of momentum recently. Um, so it's important to understand and to know about uh, what's, what's happening. Uh, so earlier this year, a couple months ago, Sickle 2020 was released, uh, which had a huge number of improvements and got quite a bit of press in terms of the things that were added to it. Um, it's evolving quickly, not just in features, but also the number of people that are contributing and those that are working to implement it. So there's quite a shift to more uh, more traction of Sickle as this heterogeneous programming framework on top of C++. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's, it's growing faster than, uh, than I think the, even the, the Sickle um, working group was expecting, which is, which is great. If we look at the implementations of Sickle to sort of show this, um, let's just touch on a few of them. So these are the implementations that are being developed of the, uh, the most recent Sickle. Uh, so on the left, we have the Intel Data Parallel C++ compiler with the goal of upstreaming uh, to LLVM directly. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only project that's trying to just directly uh, design features in a way that can be upstreamed uh, such that um, a, a lot of the work doesn't get replicated by everyone else. So it runs on a variety of different hardware targets. 
There's a code play implementation in Compute CPP, which notably uh, is, again, it's an implementation and development. So none of these are uh, conformance sickle 2020 yet, but various people, various implementations are working to get there. Uh, the code play implementation runs on notably some of the more embedded targets. So you'll see a, a variety at the bottom, um, including some automotive platforms. There's a Xilinx implementation or partial implementation that uh, is effectively an experimental platform that motivated and tested a lot of the features that went into Sickle today that are, we see in Sickle 2020. And there's a hip Sickle implementation that notably runs on AMD GPUs. So there's a, a quite a bit of implementation um, ecosystem starting to, uh, to build out. So just to make sure that I have the obligatory Sickle example, um, to, to give you an idea of what Sickle looks like. And again, this in this talk, we don't have time to go into the details of all the different language features. And again, that's that's multi-day tutorial to really cover a lot of it. Um, there's a lot in Sickle. Um, but let's just touch on one, one simple example. So here we have a complete Sickle application that launches four very simple kernels um, on some device. The queue highlighted in blue in the top right is uh, the the construct that allows you to bind the submission of work to a specific device. So here we haven't set uh, to bind the queue to a, a GPU or a CPU or an FPGA or anything. Um, so we just get a default constructed queue, which gives us some device that's available. And we launch four kernels into it. Um, so one of the important aspects to call out is that Sickle has a first class tasking mechanism just built in. So in this example, we have buffers and accessors that form data dependencies. The kernels that are on queued that are submitted for work um, are, are created within the parallel for construct that provides the parallelism um, for multiple work items to run, for example, of each instance of the kernel. Those are submitted to a queue and they run asynchronously from the host program. So once submitted to a queue, the host program continues and these kernels run when safe. And the sickle runtime manages when it's safe to run them, uh, possibly concurrently, but um, regardless, it moves data around and launches the kernels as needed according to the data dependencies. And of course, there are ways to add user dependencies and control dependencies and a whole bunch of, of different aspects to the graph. But fundamentally, Sickle has a, a tasking graph built in um, that makes it easy to get started running these heterogeneous applications. I'd just like to touch on a few of the additions into Sickle 2020. The previous version of Sickle um, 121 was, uh, was a few years old. So there were some massive transformations with the current version of Sickle that have been contributed by many, many different companies. And a lot of work has gone into this. So just to highlight some of the really critical ones, Unified Shared Memory enables pointer-based programming, uh, which means you can just create an allocation and just use the pointers both on host and device, which makes it much easier to use. Uh, you know, If you're a C++ programmer, it makes it much easier to get started. Um, and there, there's a variety of uh, features that provide flexibility in this. So scopes of sharing, and if you, you can have automatic or manual data movement, depending on what, what you prefer. Atomics and the memory model are another really important part of Sickle 2020. Uh, so the C++ 17 memory model has been pulled in, which is based on C++ 11, basically the C++ 11 memory model, which provides a lot more formalism than the previous Sickle had. Um, and also atomic ref has been pulled in basically, uh, I think we use the terminology pre-adopted from a future C++, C++20, to really make Sickle align with where C++ is going, and also to provide a really compelling atomic ref interface um, with some additions, things like scopes and regions that are required for heterogeneous compute and that are not in, in C++. Or I should say that are required for heterogeneous compute across a broad range of architectures underlying. Uh, some other interesting uh, features are um, reductions and group algorithms, which start to add a lot of the common primitives that you would just expect from any high performance programming framework today. Um, so fundamental constructs that a lot of algorithms and a lot of applications need, but that you don't want to have to write yourself uh, for all the different targets you might be running on. So the, um, the reductions built in and also a variety of group algorithms. Here we show reductions, but there are a variety of others as well. Uh, let you very easily access common patterns, uh, and you know, in this case, a reduction with the um, the reduction operator that you define. Um, it can either be user defined or one of the one of, uh, one of a set of standard reduction operations. So we provide a lot of flexibility without requiring everyone to figure out what hardware they're running on and adapt their code for all the different classes of hardware. So a lot of the additions into Sickle 2020 have been in this vein, also simplifying code, making it easier to write Sickle, reducing the barrier to get started um, and to get performance. Uh, 
Um, so there are a huge number of other additions and, and enhancements that I won't mention here, um, but there's a lot of, there's been some press and Kronos has a bunch of documentation on it. And before we move on to some of the, the some more of the challenges or some of the challenges, um, I want to just touch on Spear V because it's I think it's important for a lot of people in the industry to be aware of because it's really transformed a lot of what we do and what the industry is doing on these stacks. So if you look at the diagram, um, at the top we have Sickle. This is the uh, an example of the Chronos compute stack. So using Chronos standards all the way down to hardware. Uh, Sickle has effectively two parts. Uh, it has the kernels, which are going to run on some accelerator device, and it comes from the kernel language, or in, in Sickle it's called the device code. And these are the programs that will run on some accelerators, um, often be queued to say a GPU or an FPGA. And also we have the runtime APIs that do things like move data and on queue kernels for execution on some device. So Spear V is a kernel standard that fits into the kernel path of this flow. And uh, it, it supports both compute shaders, so things like OpenCL shaders, uh, sorry, OpenCL kernels, um, but also um, graphic shaders, so things like Vulkan um, graphic shaders for GPUs. So the Spirvi ecosystem uh, supports a variety of different types of compute. And the it's been fairly transformative because Spear V effectively decouples the way you generate kernels from the consumer of those kernels. Before Spear V, um, an implementation would have to build you know, a kernel compiler, the, so the front end effectively, and also the back end implementations. Spear V provides a decoupling in a standardized way that allows, for example, Sickle to generate kernels, which could be consumed by a variety of back ends, or a variety of front ends, like domain specific languages and other tooling to generate um, kernels that can run on OpenCL or, or other other backends. And a lot of the Spear V tooling is being integrated increasingly into LLVM in a variety of different ways, and there's a lot ongoing right now. So this decoupling has been really important for the industry, and especially people building compilers. So if you're not aware of it, please be aware, and please look into it if you are, you're building tool chains. So let's get into some of the interesting challenges that have been, um, we've been dealing with a lot and form, they drive a lot of the work that's being done within data parallel C++ language design and one API uh, specifications and implementations in general. So first, portability is, um, <laughs> the, the word portability is fraught with misunderstanding and a whole bunch of complication and everyone seems to mean something different when they talk about it. So let's just have um, spend a few minutes describing what the, some of the different definitions are and what we're talking about, which we can then look at how they apply to uh, the one API strategy. So as we're programming for heterogeneous systems, meaning that there are likely different types of accelerator in your system um, that you, you want to access or at least that you might, you might access. Uh, first, we have functional portability, which is the idea that code will just execute cor correctly across those architectures. So if you write code that's designed to run with some performance on a GPU, um, it would just run on an FPGA, for example. That would be functional portability. Performance transparency is a really important concept that we, we talk about a lot um, because it is effectively the ability to remove some of the magic from the, the tool chain flows and compiler flows such that a developer can reason about how code will map, how structures in the language um, will map to specific types of hardware, such that they can predict how it will perform and also how changing their code will, will impact the performance um, or correctness even on an architecture. So performance transparency is, the, uh, is one of the fundamental building blocks of data parallel C++ and comes into a lot of the language design to make sure that features are designed in a way where a developer can reason about how they will map to the hardware um, and how to change code to make it map differently. And then performance portability is what most people are actually thinking when they, they think of portability, uh, which is the idea that an, an application would run well, so achieve, you know, maybe we'd say acceptable performance on different architectures, um, while maintaining core code portability, meaning without rewriting the code for each different architecture. And with all of these definitions, uh, there's this always built-in assumption that people don't want to rewrite their code for each architecture. So it's not really functionally portable if you had to throw out your code from one architecture and rewrite it with a totally different code path for the other architecture. Most people don't consider that portability. So we always have this implicit expectation that we want to not have massive changes. We want some minimal changes to achieve functional and performance portability, for example. So one of the uh, challenges is that um, we see in research and we see in industry is that often portability is not well-defined. And when it's not well-defined, everyone just always assumes the last one, performance portability, and then people get massively disappointed when they don't see performance portability, which is uh, across broad sets of architectures an almost unsolved problem in the industry today. 
uh, there, there, it's not something that you know you just quickly provide easy portability between vastly different architectures. And that's not what most of these solutions today are trying to enable. So I think it's important to be very clear what's meant by portability, um, both in you know whatever the industry is talking about these things and also uh, when what research does. So how does this apply to one API? So I'm showing again the one API stacks of both direct programming and API-based programming. The overall goal of both of these together is to give functional portability. So the uh, ability to have code that runs well on, or that runs, um, sorry, there, so have the ability to have code that runs on a variety of architecture with the least, um, the least hard, or the least code changes to move from one architecture to another. So we want to get functional portability as first class goal um, with minimal code changes to make that achievable. Data parallel C++ and direct programming wants to provide performance transparency to make it possible to tune for each architecture uh, and you know, provide the frameworks in place to have divergent code paths, for example, so that you can have one tune for one architecture and another tune for a different architecture for your um, for your high performance regions of your you know, your secret sauce code. And then the library based programming is aims to um, to provide the portable performance aspect, where a consistent interface can be exposed, some le high level abstraction that then has different highly optimized backing implementations that are done for you. So you don't need to think about how to actually move across architectures and maintain performance. That just is provided by the higher level abstraction and by implementation. So let's get into a bit more bit more of the challenges of portability. Um, the first thing to uh, talk about is how, uh, as you look from one architecture to another, uh, particularly very vastly different architectures, the performance features that are available in one versus another architecture can be drastically different and not make sense across those different architectures. And that's one of the first challenges that we hit when looking at even functional portability. So these diagrams show one of the common design balancing decisions that has to have to be made um, as we look at how to build uh, both language features and data parallel C++, but also implementations that will run on multiple different architectures. Um, so if, if we take each of these diagrams in the perspective of one single architecture, we observe that uh, some features in a language might be natively supported. So for example, a scalar adder is probably supported in all of the different architectures. Other features, though, won't be and other features won't make sense on certain architectures. So we have the choice to, on the left, emulate those, those features, which tend to be non-performance. So you end, to get, end up getting bad performance with certain features on a hardware that doesn't support them or where that, where that uh, feature doesn't make sense. Um, but this provides good functional portability. As we move to the right side of the diagram, um, we end up in the case where there are, there's no emulation of features and you have either what's natively supported on the device and everything else is just not supported. And this provides uh, not much uh, functional portability for some sets of code that uses those features in a not supported region, but it makes it much easier for people who really know what they want for performance to get the performance. Um, and the challenge here is that different developers ask for different mixes of these, or different ratios of these emulated versus not supported um, features uh, pretty extensively. So there's really no answer that, that can um, satisfy different developers. And for example, on the right-hand side, developers who are going through pure performance on a specific platform, uh, they don't want to get bad performance if they're running an emulated feature. They just want it to not compile or to fail to launch because it's not going to get good performance, uh, whereas others want that functional portability on the left side of the diagram. So this is a constant, uh, a constant challenge that you know, has to be factored into uh, a lot of the feature design. So to be a little bit more concrete, uh, what are some features that might make not might not make sense across architectures? So on the left side here, we have data flow pipes, which are a feature used extensively in spatial architectures such as FPGA, which um, uh, we can describe very simply the data flow pipes as first in, first out FICO communication channels, where one kernel might write, another kernel might read. And the uh, one of the common use cases for these is to access um, I.O. interfaces, uh, amongst other things on spatial architectures. But for example, having a kernel directly talking to a network stack or a physical interface. Um, these pipes really make sense a lot in spatial architectures, such as FPGA, but not in other architectures. And likewise, subgroups, which are uh, in some sense designed to map to vector hardware, uh, so SIMD hardware units uh, in, in various types of accelerators, um, they make uh, a lot of sense and are critical on those architectures, but when you go to an FPGA, for example, um, and some of the architectures, you very quickly get into base questions like, 
well, they don't have vector instruction units. Um, so what do you say about the subgroup? Do you make it degenerate at size one, but then code tends not to be written for that? It doesn't work correctly. Or do you say they're not supported? When we look at these features, though, um, that are specific to you know, sets of architectures, uh, the obvious solution is to just emulate everything. And that's where uh, a really important lesson learned from the industry comes in that I'm, I'm hoping to, to convey adequately here. So that comes down to what OpenCL did. And OpenCL took the approach of emulating all of the features everywhere to get functional portability. And more specifically, uh, OpenCL says that when there's a feature in the core specification, any implementation of OpenCL must implement it. At least that's what OpenCL used to say. So before the most recent release of OpenCL, there were six versions out there. There were the three 1.x versions and then three 2.x versions. And what we saw in the industry was that the 1.x versions were adopted uh, quite extensively by many different types of hardware and, in fact, led the way in heterogeneous compute standards. Um, I mean, even FPGAs were supported relatively early in the OpenCL development cycle. Um, so FPGA supported you know, 1.x versions of OpenCL very early. But then the OpenCL 2.0 version was released, and it failed to see adoption. And the fundamental reason is that 2.0 was a major version bump over the 1.x because it had many new features that were added, and they were all made required. And those features supported many diverse types of architectures, including FPGA. They had a pipes feature, which were like the data flow pipes I showed on the previous slide. That meant that it was expensive to build an OpenCL version. You had to implement as, an, as a vendor um, many features that you didn't want for your hardware, but that would provide functional portability. And the result was that the industry didn't adopt OpenCL 2.x. Uh, there was a relatively uh, slow adoption from some companies, and many didn't. And in fact, we started to see this really strange backporting process where a company would be shipping a 1.2 implementation, and they would create an extension that would um, allow a feature from a future version of OpenCL to be available on top of OpenCL 1.2, for example. So effectively backporting future features they wanted to an older version of OpenCL to incrementally get access to those features. So what was the solution? Um, the solution was to have OpenCL 3.0, which released late last year. And it simply made many more features in OpenCL optional and queryable. Um, and as a result, this started to drive a lot more adoption of OpenCL. So we're seeing a lot more adoption. OpenCL is effectively recovering in terms of the, um, the, the adoption trend and implementation trend. Um, and we're seeing a lot more implementations of OpenCL 3.0 become available. So some of the core changes were that uh, features became optional instead of being required. So that if a feature was interesting for uh, the customers of some hardware vendor, they could expose that feature. But if it wasn't interesting, they didn't have to spend the time to and the cost to implement and bug fix and such an emulated feature that no one really wanted. It also enabled the idea of layering, where a middleware and other types of software can begin to exist that do emulate features that don't exist on hardware. So if you're writing some application that you want to run everywhere and you want to use a specific feature, you can then start incorporating middleware layers that will emulate the feature where it's not available, um, but you, you know, use the native feature where it is available. Um, and this has really been transformative for, for OpenCL. So this is an important lesson learned about uh, just making everything available everywhere. So to close out the topic of performance and portability, productivity, um, we have a lot of people are doing work on this. There's a workshop at Supercomputing um, every year on this topic. Um, and there are some people at Intel that drive a lot of the work on metrics for this space. So let's just talk about the two sides of the equation that need to be considered together when you look at portability, uh, performance portability. So on the left, we have a performance portability metric. Um, and again, the paper is linked where this is defined. Um, and Intel does a fair bit of work on, on this topic. So the performance portability metric allows you to measure the efficiency of an implementation across platforms. And even that becomes a very complicated topic um, because you have to consider whether you're looking at efficiency uh, relative to device peak performance, such as you know, a roofline model, which might not actually be optimized well, versus uh, the best known application. So comparing against the best known implementation of an algorithm. So there's work on this performance portability metric um, that allows you to measure how well code performs on the on the platforms where it runs correctly relative to each other. But that has to be paired with the code divergence metric, um, because you can get good performance portability on this metric if you rewrite your code for each architecture. And that's, again, not what most people want. So you have to also consider how much code changes from you know, how, what is the convergence of the code paths between two different targets 
to get that performance portability number. Um, and there's a, other work done by Intel, and there's an open source project to help actually examine code bases and, and measure the divergence or convergence um, on different architectures within the code base. So these together um, can allow us to start reasoning and asking better questions on, on uh, what, what are we doing to achieve performance portability or functional portability with language features. So Intel is tracking these metrics on a lot of the, the work that's being done across various benchmarks and, um, and applications. And uh, this gives you just, you know, a, 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 I guess a, a pseudo graph of what this, what a plot could look like. Um, so the, the idea is that you'd want to get no convergence or no divergence of code paths and maximum performance portability across devices, but that's not achievable in the industry today. So instead we measure how much code has to change and how much performance can be achieved across architectures. And that leads to some really important questions on many of the feature designs, um, such as do we want this feature to be supported across architectures or is it better just to make it an architecture specific feature? Um, and then how do these features get interpreted if we do make them available across all the different architectures? Do they have the same meaning or are they fundamentally different concepts? And this gets really complicated with things like independent forward progress guarantees and various scopes of execution across different architectures. So this, uh, these questions and the, the tracking lead to, um, lead to some really important observations being made that impact the, the design of language. So I'd, I'd encourage everyone to, to look into these things if you, if you haven't, if you're doing, doing language design. Now the, the last big topic I want to talk about is uh, the mapping of a direct programming language, an XP direct programming language that has constructs that can, in theory, map across many different architectures, how do those map to the hardware? And what are some of the, the challenges and lessons learned that we, we've already hit? So let's begin with some definitions or some terminology. Now, these, these terms are incredibly controversial in that uh, if you ask a few people, you'll get more than that number of people uh, answers. Um, so you know, if, if you go into Intel and ask uh, three experts, what these mean, you'll often get five different answers as the joke goes. Um, and that's because these concepts are used at many different levels of abstraction. So whether it's the description of the hardware or some programming, some layer of the programming model abstraction, they mean so many different things, they become very difficult to talk about. But let me define um, you know, for this, this discussion uh, what I mean by some of these terms. So if we start at the bottom, we have maybe some SIMD execution unit or some vector execution unit on some type of hardware that has you know, for example, um, uh, maybe an adder that operates on eight scalers at the same time. So it's an eight-way adder um, and a vector, therefore a vector adder unit. To actually map code and write code that maps well to that, that hardware, uh, one possible way is the top left, single instruction, single data, so some serial expression of the program, maybe with a loop that has some auto vectorizer that maps that to hardware, or maybe a pragma on the loop that directs the compiler uh, what's safe to do in terms of vectorization from the scalar or from the serial code. We have single instruction multiple data, SIMD, um, which might have explicit vector instructions in it that map directly to that hardware, and experts often like using this for very small parts of their code. And then on the right, we have the more, uh, one of the big um, evolutions in the industry, which is the single program multiple data, SPIMD programming model, where we have the code written from the perspective of one lane or one scalar element of the vector hardware unit. And then we have the concept of many of these running side by side in some sense or logically together to fill out that vector hardware. And uh, the SPIMD execution model has a variety of advantages we'll talk about in the, um, or the SPIMD programming model has a variety of advantages we'll talk about in, in coming slides. But it's been one of those things that's really transformed how people can think about writing parallel code and also writing portable code. But one of the first observations we find looking at OpenCL or other language designs is that it's not just the language constructs that matter, but it's the composition of both the language constructs you add and also the implementation decisions made in a specific compiler and hopefully documented in that compiler. So for example, languages can be pretty vague on uh, what the mapping should be. And in fact, they might want to enable multiple mappings in different modes of the language or even you know, automatically. Uh, but this can get really confusing. So what are two possible interpretations of this example OpenCL program? So here in this, this OpenCL, we have, um, we have vectors explicit and vector operations. So here we have uh, four floats together and a float for a vector and some operation, first a load and then an, an addition on them. 
And two obvious ways to map this. Um, on the left, we have a direct mapping to vector hardware. So perhaps we have four lane vector hardware under the hood, and this kernel just directly maps to that, that vector instruction set. Another common interpretation, though, and we see this in most OpenCL implementations and most data parallel C++ implementations, um, would be the idea that the vector is actually a convenience type. And it doesn't actually map in any way to the vector hardware, but instead it gets unrolled over time, such that you still have each instance of this program operating in a different lane, and then the vectors get unrolled over time across that lane. So this is the difference between uh, an explicit SIMD mapping versus some math convenience type um, interpretation of the vector. So the advantages of some advantages of each, there are many more that we would cover here. But um, on the left side, uh, experts often ask for these direct mappings because it lets them effectively get an assembly level access to the hardware in a higher level language with type safety and other things added. Um, and sometimes it's called explicit SIMD. Um, but you have to really be close to the hardware to understand what that mapping is going to be. On the right, we have less of a tie to hardware. Um, and really critically, in the SPMD, SPMD programming model, there's often no guarantee of ordering between different work items executing the same SPMD program. So that provides a lot of flexibility and freedom for implementations to map well across very different hardware. It's also easier to learn the SPMD model um, because you have a, a mental model for parallelism that scales across hardware, whether it's a CPU, GPU, FPGA. You can very uh, e relatively easily understand how that might map to hardware under the hood. So we have this divergence of possible interpretations. The question is, what should the compiler implement? And this leads to one of the important lessons learned in Sickle. Other languages as well, but Sickle got hit by this recently. So Sickle had the, the notion of a vector. It had a Sickle vec, um, which was ambiguous in which of these interpretations should be taken. And therefore, different compilers were implementing in different ways. And we saw developers using the Sickle vec both as a math convenience wrapper um, so you know, to be unrolled over time, and also as a, an explicit vector hardware mapping. And sometimes they were even using those, both those interpretations in the same program. So very quickly, you get into the question of well, how is the compiler supposed to implement this? And there is no answer. There's no way to implement that um, in, in most solutions in a way that a, a user can reason about and write correct code. So SQL 2020 is trying to fix this um, and made a, a big step in that direction um, to disambiguate the meaning of the, the language feature such that the intent is explicit. So SQL added an M array type, meaning math array, which is the convenience type um, that we would expect to have unrolled across iterations of your SPMD programming model as opposed to being a vector mapping. And C++ is adding a vector mapping. So the std SIMD type is not in C++ yet, um, but SQL is intending to align with that as it, it makes it into C++. Um, so that would provide an alternate explicit SIMD type that would then let something like SQL back be not recommended for use or deprecated. Um, and then SQL also added some formalization with things like subgroups to formalize the execution model guarantees. So now let's quickly walk through an evolution to get to something that's, I think, interesting and a very recent development in, in SQL. So we have um, the notion of code, and in this case, a parallel four with some SPMD code that will be mapped to hardware. The very simple form of a parallel four in SQL leaves all the uh, implementation details to the, um, to the runtime or to the compiler, such that you say, I want this total work um, to be applied, or my, my kernel to be applied to this total range of work, and implementation, go figure out how that maps to the hardware. There's a more explicit form where the user can choose things like a work group size, and uh, can control things like the mapping to a GPU fairly explicitly, um, and also introduces some new things like local, local memory and some other um, hierarchies of memory that make it easy to tune for specific architectures. But even with these, uh, the more control and the more control we look at adding, there's always the observation that real applications tend not to be quite so simple, and pure SPMD is not quite the right abstraction for 100% of all code. And the, base reason for that is that a lot of hardware does have very high performance explicit instructions that, allay, uh, that allow cross-lane communication, for example, within the vector instructions in the hardware. And the SPMD model is very flexible and has seen a lot of success because it scales across different hardware, but it makes it very expensive and difficult to express the communication across lanes of the, the vector machine, if that's what you're running on. So Sickle added a subgroup abstraction. This is OpenCL did as well. Um, and Sickle is really built on that. 
So the subgroup abstraction provides some additional decomposition of a work group um, into a one-dimensional set of, of small groupings that can provide additional guarantees on things like independent forward progress, depending on the device, and also provide communication across elements of that grouping. And in theory, those uh, those subgroups can then map directly to SIMD hardware, if that's what makes sense in your, in your application or for your specific architecture. So subgroups provide a decomposition level that make it possible to express these cross-lane communications that somewhat step slightly above the SPMD execution model. They let you think a little bit more in terms of, uh, of SIMD and how that might map to your hardware. And this, this falls in the performance transparency uh, lane of, of direct programming. But sometimes people need a little bit more. And I wanna talk in the next two slides about another feature that, um, that we've been recently experimenting with and adding that shows some of the direction we're going to enable tuning in a very small percent of code for the really advanced developers, but that reduces the risk of using something like Data Parallel C++ to access hardware. So sometimes um, some developers, the, the developers who really know the hardware they're targeting, uh, want for a few lines of code to access something that's not easily available or expressible through the SPMD abstraction, even with subgroups. Um, so sometimes that's to get uh, an, an intrinsic, for example, that's not exposed to a subgroup operation yet. Sometimes it's to work around a compiler bug. Um, sometimes it's, it's just because that's how the, the user thinks. So we're adding features to enable this type of execution model stepping um, in a very well-defined way that can also um, incorporate some of the programming model aspects of other languages that are not captured in, in DPC++ yet. So in this case, we're talking um, about one, one example, which is the invoke SIMD extension. You can see the link at the bottom. And the idea with this extension is that it allows you to invoke a function in a different execution model context if you're an expert and you really know what you're doing and you want to write vector code for some so, so explicit SIMD code in some very small region of code. From your SPMD code, you can call invoke SIMD to invoke the scale function, in this case, um, in an explicit SIMD fashion. And therefore, that scale function can be written in, a, in an explicit vector mapping way that you can reason about how it maps to specific hardware. It could have intrinsics, for example, in it. There's also, uh, we start to add hints such as uniform, um, that's a directive from the user that the, across all the uh, work items that are in a subgroup, they will, um, that the value will be uniform within that single subgroup, which enables a bunch of compiler optimizations not otherwise possible. So this diagram just shows what that looks like. Um, so if we have some SPMD execution context, um, invoke SIMD can be, can be called um, that calls some other function, which then steps into an explicit SIMD context for a very small region of code that the user can then have, or the developer can, um, can put intrinsics or some, some other language even into, um, and can directly program to the hardware to reduce risk. And then uh, when they return from that, they step back into the SPMD, the easy to reason about um, and much more portable set of, um, or much more portable programming model. And this really helps to reduce things like code divergence if you are tuning for some very specific architectures. Um, I won't spend time on this because we're, we're a bit short on time, um, but there's a lot to talk about with um, mapping to diverse architectures such as FPGA that really take advantage of what one architecture can offer for performance over a different architecture. Um, so for example, tight loop carried dependencies on a spatial architecture such as FPGA can map very cleanly from um, the common language of data parallel C++. So to conclude, um, that we're living in a very heterogeneous world today. I think we all we all know this. Um, there are many different classes of accelerator, and one API is an open project um, and uh, open source tooling, and uh, has ambition to become just upstream LLVM for a lot of it, um, and otherwise open source and and um, cross vendor, cross hardware solution that tries to tackle this heterogeneous problem in an open way that everyone can contribute to and leverage. Uh, so we have the stack of software, C++ with Sickle on top and um, fast moving community extensions um, that feed into each other. And then we have this middle layer of the software stack that provides libraries, direct programming interfaces, tooling that become consistent and make it much lower risk and easier to actually start leveraging uh, a variety of the different hardware in the system without having to switch between frameworks. And also though the whole thing is designed in a unified way, thinking of XPU as opposed to just disjoint accelerators. The idea is that uh, the features in the language and the interfaces are designed from the ground up to scale across these different architectures and then to enable the specialization where, where you need to. 
We published a recent book on data parallel C++. So uh, we didn't have time today to go through almost any of the details of the language because there, there's so much there in Sickle and extensions on top. Um, but we do have this book now out to that free in PDF form. You can just download it. You can also buy print copies, of course. Um, and this is the first book on either data parallel C++ or Sickle, which is going a long way, it seems, to uh, broadening the ecosystem of people actually building on, on Sickle. Uh, particularly, the raw specs are designed for implementers, not for reading and for understanding the language. Um, so it's been a pretty big, um, pretty, tra pretty transformative already um, to have, have a book like this to, uh, to help the ecosystem. Then finally, how can you participate? Um, so if you have thoughts on what the heterogeneous framework should look like across accelerators, or you want to contribute, you want to do research, please get involved. This is an open project. Um, a lot of people are helping with it. Intel is contributing a lot, but a lot from outside Intel are contributing a lot as well these days. Uh, at the top right, you can find the link to try it out. So you can either download the tools and the languages. Um, some of them are open source. A lot of it's open source that you can download and build yourself, but you can also build it, um, sorry, download pre-built packages. There's also the Intel Dev Cloud, where everything's installed for you, so you can get up and running very quickly. It's a cloud service that's free. Um, it also has a lot of hardware, so it has FPGAs and GPUs in it, for example, that you, so you don't have to buy them. You can just get started trying them out. There's also a lot of opportunity to contribute to Data Parallel C++, so whether that's in uh, the community extensions that are on GitHub, you can just get involved in those, or if you have ideas, publish your own extensions and, and help to implement them. Um, Sickle, you can get involved with within Kronos, either through the free advisory panel or as a contributor member, uh, which does cost something, but you can join as a contributor to Sickle. And of course, there are many ways to influence ISO C++, which is the long-term path for a lot of the features that are being developed today. I'd like to thank just a few colleagues, um, both inside Intel and outside Intel, uh, within the, the Kernel Sickle working group that have worked uh, a lot over the past few years to help build out Sickle. And if you look at Sickle 2020, it's a transformative set of changes over previous Sickles that have really started to bootstrap the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, please get involved, and thanks to all of these people. So Julian Bin, um, I have not been following questions if there are any, so I don't know if Oh, wonderful. Hey, you thank you so much for your talk. That was really very nice. And I think you really addressed and nailed a couple of questions and framed them in such a way that we see that there are still things to be done, things that need to be researched. And I'll read you a couple of questions now that we got from the audience. So David first asked, he noticed that SQL just added support for unified memory in 2020. That seems relatively slow compared to other APIs. With the nature of GPU architectures changing so quickly, are you worried about feature lag from the hardware to the tool chain? Oh, yes, I, I mean, it's a great point. Um, I think the core challenge with Sickle, and the, re the answer to that question is that there weren't enough people involved in Sickle, and no one was really working on the open. There, weren't, there wasn't enough work on some of these open standards uh, that everyone could contribute to. So I, I don't think there's a fundamental reason other than people didn't do it. And yeah, it's, it's late, um, but it's there now. And I think it's done in a, a very nice and unified way with the rest of Sickle. Um, there are other frameworks that have worked to add a variety of features. Like there, are not, there are a lot of heterogeneous frameworks. If you look at Cocos and Raja and such, but a lot of these features that are needed at the you know, effectively harder driver level, uh, they need some open ecosystem. So I think if you look at the changes from Sickle 1.2.1 to Sickle 2020, there are a huge number of transformative changes that seem, um, you know, you'll ask the same question, why weren't these here before? But now they are there, and now the new features that are coming are really pushing the boundary in a lot of these, a lot of the, um, a lot of the programmability aspects. And, and I think the, the core is that a lot more people are involved now, and Sickle is finally getting the traction it needs and the ecosystem development it needs. Wonderful, yeah. So my, a question from me. So I, I find that some C++ themes, themes in SQL, they are rather complex. You know, C++ itself can have some already some templates and stuff, magic, that are complicated, but in SQL, even more. And I personally saw, found very nice that you had some, mentioned some aspects of usability in your talk. However, there is one key aspect of usability um, from the perspective of a new programmer, right? So let's say you have a, a mediocre C++ programmer and they have to get used to SQL. Is there some kind of consideration or any kind of survey that you conducted how easy and difficult those kind of developers um, have it? 
Uh, yeah, there's, there's actually a lot. So this this takes a lot of our time, these sort of discussions, um, and a lot of we consider this a lot in language design. So there, the couple things I'll say are um, C++ is somewhat polarizing. There are a lot of developers who love C++, and there are a lot of people, well, I don't know a lot, there are people who don't like C++ um, and like something else. Uh, so part of the one API direction is to not require people to switch to the C++. So if there are other things you like, you can interoperate with and use those those solutions. And there, there are a lot of details there I don't have time to go into now. Um, but C++ itself can be very complicated. And the earlier versions of Sickle were very verbose and complex, in part because they used earlier versions of C++. So a lot of the work that went into Sickle 2020 was to simplify the interface using things like, well, so one of the main reasons to switch to C++ 17 as a baseline for Sickle was that it had class template argument deduction, CTAD. And if you look at comparisons of code for things like accessors from before Sickle 2020 until using Sickle 2020, uh, there, there's no comparison. It becomes so much easier. Um, so we're very actively trying to simplify the interfaces to make it not required to use complicated uh, C++ unless you want to. But what we do find with a lot of real application development is that having access to the advanced C++ features is transformative. It really makes it much easier with you know, metaprogramming, for example, to do very complicated things that would previously would have required compiler changes and compiler support. So I think it's it effectively goes both ways. Um, we're working extremely hard, though, to simplify the interfaces and not require wild C++ for basic programs. And I think we've gone we've gone a lot of the way there with C, with Sickle 2020. Um, there's still some way to go, and this again is uh, is constantly discussed by both Kronos and and people at Intel. But again, if if you have if you have things to contribute, please get involved, um, or even just file issues on things that you think should be simpler. Um, but yeah, we're constantly working this. I, did I I hope I answered the right question there. Um, or addressed it well enough. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. So I think you answered also the next question from Eric about this issue. He also mentioned that people either love it or hate it. Um, so the next question um, is, given that you performance transparency is one goal that you mentioned, a key goal of the One API, I, I wonder if when you, when you um, thought about this emulating of features versus native features, right? Maybe some users would accept um, a performance bound. So if you run a program and you try to compile it and you could say, I accept 20% performance loss in emulated features, yeah? And then you compile it and, and it would run through, you would kind of know it's, yeah, it may use emulated features, but I'm okay because it's at maximum 20% slower or something. And I, I wonder if such kind of idea could be integrated um, given that you have this, you know, performance transparency already mentioned? Uh, I think a lot of these things can absolutely be in integrated, um, but there are, there, there are a lot of work um, to, to, to properly support, especially across very diverse architectures. So I think that's, that's part of the constant balance between, you know, effort spent building new features and um, emulating with less performance versus a lot of these modeling tasks. But I think you'll see a lot more of this going forward, not maybe not specifically that. Um, but the, the question of what to emulate versus what not to emulate and whether open source layers should start to exist that do the emulation so a developer has more explicit choice about whether they want to have emulation um, or not. I think a lot of, we'll see a lot more um, open development, I think, solving some of these problems, but we're not we're not quite there yet. Um, but yes, all, all these things are possible. And um, again, it's it's a constant challenge because you talk to two or four people and you get two or four different answers at least on, on what someone wants. So I think we're still looking for input as well on, on these aspects if you have any. All right, our next question from David. Is there a good quantification of the performance difference for the language mapping to SIMD versus SPIMD? Um, I mean, that, that, that's a very complicated question to ask because it will depend completely on the workload and the architecture. So I'm actually not sure how to answer that. I think um, if you, so there was the, the equations I showed on the, um, the performance portability, one of the performance portability slides. Um, so they, um, John Pennycook and Jason Sewall, Victor the others, they've defined um, fairly rigorous ways to measure this um, and various options. And again, there's the supercomputing uh, workshop that actually talks about these metrics. So you can very rigorously define and measure the difference um, in, uh, in performance across these different architectures. Um, and one of those steps could be between explicit SIMD versus a SPIMD model. Um, but in general, we see good mapping. So the SPIMD, SPMD features things like with the, the addition of things like subgroups, we see a very good mapping to the hardware. Otherwise, this wouldn't be a viable solution. 
Um, so I think there are, in many cases, uh, there's an extremely good mapping, but I, I, I can't really answer more than that. It depends so much on a specific case, and we'd have to look at look at examples. All right. <clears throat> I think the next question from Dave is an experimental feature where you could um, actually switch between SIMD and SP, SPIMD, right? And the question he asked is also, surely there is some kind of overhead associated with this um, feature, the question is: Can do you have any idea um, about the quantification of this? Also, um, so I, I can't share any numbers on that right now. Um, but I will say that it depends a lot on the backend implementation, because a lot of backends are always lower, are already lowering uh, from you know the SPMD context to some vector context directly. So. Um, like I said, we challenge that there has to be an overhead. It depends a lot on implementation details, and the uh, it depends on the compiler stack, the specific hardware. Um, but part of the reason that uh, these features are compelling is because there's not a huge overhead. Um, but again, it depends so much on implementation details and how much the implementation optimizes for that context switch. Um, and again, in many cases, there is no, there no, there's no realized context switch. Um, but certainly, you can implement it in extremely expensive ways, where then you would need a lot of code in that explicit SIMD region, which would, in many cases, defeat the point. So not, right. I guess not, not the problem that's trying to be solved. Okay. So the next question from David: Are there plans to add support for other chip manufacturers? I know you mentioned OpenCL, but wasn't sure if that was being leveraged from IMD and NVIDIA, for example. Right. So Sickle in 2020 generalized so that it could run on not just an OpenCL backend, but a diverse set of backends. Um, so it, it basically provided interop with more than just OpenCL. Um, so it, the aim is to enable uh, Sickle to run on many different, uh, effectively, driver or runtime layers so that it can run anywhere. There's no conceptual reason that it can't just be, you know, have backends that run on all targets. Um, so OpenCL is used, for example, by Intel FPGAs um, as the way to expose, and also other architectures that expose OpenCL um, that uh, the Intel data C++ compiler will run on. Um, other implementations like HipSickle uh, leverage the like, leverage HIP to actually access AMD GPUs and, and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so OpenCL can be is already part of the picture. If, for example, AMD supported OpenCL, specific versions of OpenCL, uh, the implementations of Sickle that lower to OpenCL should just work on those targets. And that's really the power of OpenCL. It's the standard thing that lets higher levels of the stack, like Sickle, run everywhere. But not everyone is providing consistent OpenCL yet. So there are, is the need in the industry for some of these implementations to run on different backends. And hopefully that changes. OK, yeah, we got two questions left from Chen. And so first question is, loop optimization is important for good performance, especially caching. Does SQL or one API consider this interaction with the compiler, or is it orthogonal to what you do? OK, so I'm um, hoping I get the, the question properly. But I, um, performance transparency aims to make it possible to reason about these things. And fundamentally, the compiler that you would use to worry about uh, trying to code with things like cache optimization in mind, it's the same compiler stack that Sickle is running through. So the the goal and like what we we realize this goal is to allow the code to be tuned for these effects. So it's not like Sickle is at a higher level of abstraction where you just have to hope for the best. For example, um, you can code in Sickle in ways that um, enable all of these optimizations you typically expect. Um, of course, those become more hardware specific and even you know model of the hardware may behave differently from another model of the same architecture once you start tuning in this way. But all of the, the features should be in place to, um, and, and there, there are still some that are being added now that help with some of these questions. Um, so things like, um, like caching. Uh, there are additional knobs being added to the language for specific hardware to enable the really fast, like the, the last basically portion of a percent of tuning. Um, but there's nothing fundamentally missing from SQL to enable that if you could do it in other languages. All right, yeah. Um, so I think the last question actually relates to the to this question. So given the example of SIMD and SPIMD, it may be argued that the selection is better left to a compiler based on how the loop nest is optimized. I think that's a remark. I mean, would you? Yes. Yeah, so I think, uh, I, yes, OK. That, that, um, 
there are all sorts of different possible cases in this discussion. And um, again, there's, there's, it's not just cut and dry one, like one versus another. Um, but certainly the compiler can perform certain types of optimizations. And the feature to step, step into an explicit SIMD region, for example, is when the user does need to take control and take control from the compiler. So there are a lot of interesting questions that emerge. I think probably what you're getting at in terms of how these different um, programming models nest within each other and how that interacts with compiler optimization. Um, what I showed was to uh, provide explicit user control in the case where there's you know, an, an, a special intrinsic that's desired. Um, that provides part of the story, but it's not necessarily the complete story. Um, so yes, you shouldn't go and just start writing explicit SIMD code unless there's a reason to. The compiler does a great job in most cases for you uh, and, and various complex, complex transforms. OK, awesome. So that were all the questions. And I think you saw that there was quite some interaction between the audience and you. So there is a really interesting I haven't read talk. Yet. <laughs> and um, feel free to um, share a couple of links in our Google Doc that you might find particularly relevant. Um, I would be very curious, again, about this usability aspect if you want to share something um, more um, about it. And in that sense, our first session, our keynote session is now over. Thank you all for attending. So we reconvene in 15 minutes. Yeah, we are supposed to have now a break since 15 minutes already, but we, we kind of anticipated that. That's why we put the break over here. So see you later after the coffee in 15 minutes. And thanks, Mike, again for this wonderful talk. Great, thanks for having me.